Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Geometer's Compass. This is Jeff speaking from Dublin in Ireland, and this is... Scott speaking from Victoria, Canada. Hello, Scott. Welcome. So we are on podcast number 12, and we are very excited um, to be speaking about a topic that's really dear to both Scott's and mine, uh, my heart. And we, we have great fun, by the way, trying to come up with topics to discuss for these podcasts. And one of the ones that jumped out at us for this one was Scott has done a huge amount of work uh, in Secrets in Plain Sight in his video series, which runs for well over three hours, which you released over 10 years ago, is it, Scott? Yeah, back in 2010. Well, if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. But for the sake of this podcast, you don't need to worry about all that because we're going to bring to you one of the sort of premium chapters from the series, which is speaking about the alignments in the city of Paris, France, okay? Now, that might sound a little bit uninviting right now, but I promise you, if you stay with us for this chat, it's going to be absolutely mind-blowing when we lay out all of the kind of the synchronicities, the coincidences, the alignments, which really makes you kind of shake your head and go, wait, what? With the beauty um, and the majesty and the really considered layout of the city plan, um, that Scott so eloquently put together all those years ago. Is that a fair opening, Scott? I think so, yeah. And Paris is such a master work of, of uh, hidden, it's not really hidden, it's right there in plain sight, you know, but uh, it's actually fascinating to me all these years later about what's going on there. And it just want, it makes me wanna go back to Paris again and again and experience these things in person you know mm. um and you know i'm i'm way over here in uh north america so getting to paris is quite a trek for me but uh jeff when did you first go to that city yeah well i've had loads of experiences of paris to be honest i i was um just thinking about it my very first visit was this wonderful um, student exchange program that you do in Ireland. You know, it's very common if you're in school. And I was quite young, like I must have been 15, maybe, maybe, maybe 16 at the oldest. And I went for two weeks to visit my friend Guillaume in France, you know, because you want to learn French. That's the whole vibe. And then Guillaume comes over to me and he learns English. It's a whole nice gig. But it's kind of funny. It's kind of I don't even know whether it happens now, because at the time, my mom just set it up with this um, lovely family in Paris. But the strange thing was the actual student my age wasn't around for the first week. So I ended up just staying with this random lady called Chantal and this random man called Bruno in some apartment in the suburbs in Paris, you know, and I literally arrived in the airport and I was like, hello, are you the random person I'll be staying with for two weeks? You know, I couldn't have been luckier though, or met nicer people, but, um, and it was kind of looking back now with all of my passion for the sacred geometry in Paris. Um, you know, it seems to be extra significant because the lady Chantal, she was probably like, you know, didn't really know what to do with me. So she decided to sort of say, I'll go show him the sights, you know? So she brought me around, um, you know, all of the, you know, the Eiffel Tower and um, the Place de la Concorde and um, the, the, the Grand Arch, which, which was really stuck in my memory. I remember as a kid going down to the super modern side of Paris, looking at this extraordinary building and at the time you could go up to the top of it and have a look down. And of course I'm only 16. And at the time, do you know what else I remember stuck in my head? Kind of a funny sidebar, but rollerblading was all the rage in Paris. And they had these very kind of like smooth slabs because it's like the modern paving in the Grand Arch. And they had all the little cones out and there was these super duper expert rollerbladers, you know. Um, so it was like a, a good course to go on basically around there. 
Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. And then, so like that was, I was just a 16 year old going, woo, I love rollerblading. And what is that strange building? But I did go back a number of times subsequently, but most specifically uh, for my 40th, which is now about six years ago, myself and my wife went back and I, I had then fully absorbed your work, Scott, by that stage. And so I was able to kind of bring your work back in person and then explore this uh, axis historique, which we're going to talk about, or the, the grand axis or the historic axis or whatever it is. Um, which it, starts it doesn't, and doesn't the grand arch have quite a power when you're there in person it's such a, an impressive structure it's you know what i gotta be honest now you know and now i'm so in love with the sacred geometry of that particular shape um it did leave a mark i have to say it did leave an imprint and there's a few things that happened to me around 16 that i think were kind of seeds of this passion for sacred geometry another one happened was when i met um tibetan monks in a university in dublin city creating a Kalashakra sand mandala and I went in and honestly something happened to me in that moment you know and it leaves something with you you know you don't fully understand it as a young kid you just go wait what that's kind of weird and cool and I like it but I don't understand it I was left with the same feeling from the Grand Arch I have to say it was a building unlike any other building I'd seen up until then and certainly have not seen since like it's an it's a remarkably unique structure why don't we, we why don't we come back to that circle back to that at the end of the axis because it's sort of the 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 centerpiece of the historical axis i think it's it's the mm -hmm. kind of strange attractor at the end of the axis that that we're led to so uh yeah let's have yeah, it be yeah. our end point and let's go, go all the way to the other end of the axis in our minds yeah we'll, we'll start over at the louvre pyramid yeah, and Scott, just before I'm going to give you the floor now, you know, to, to sort of explain the, the starting point. But could I just um, maybe lay out for any listener that might be listening now who isn't familiar with your work? I just love to give a sort of a, a layman's overview about. So Scott basically looks at an aerial view of a city or a landscape or, you know, alignments on planet Earth, basically. And he's been able to kind of extrapolate or identify just very interesting correspondences and relationships between key monuments and cities, for example, or it can be um, ancient architectural sites, or it could be like famous mountains or, or you know, the depth of uh, valleys in the ocean, or it could be anything like that. Um, and what Scott's done by kind of like bringing this sort of sacred geometry lens to the world he's been able to gift all of us with these really beautiful um insights i would call them you know very very special insights and when he laid when he brought this lens to look at paris he basically uncovered these very very beautiful alignments you know that have very particular um characteristics you know so i just wanted to sort of say that's kind of what we're doing and just just in, if, in case somebody wasn't familiar scott with the way you do it i just thought i'd, I'd lay that out you know yeah, but you get, people can watch the whole epic series volumes one and two on our site for free so i encourage yeah. you to do that if you're if, if this kind of gets you interested in in the subject um, hmm. But uh, shall shall we start at the beginning and yeah, work our way so, towards yeah? Let me Grand Arch? let me. I'll could you mind? I'll kind of like I'll sort of like be the sort of I hope friendly questioner along the way, you know. But but I would um yeah I would love to you to just lay out the whole alignment from the very beginning, you know, the starting point, um as you see it, you know, as you sure. did it in the documentary. Well, there's so much to it. I I might. Uh, miss a few points, but I think I'll give you the, the highlights. It's like a, we're on a virtual tour of, of Paris now. So let, let's get out of the tour bus and walk over to the uh, Louvre Pyramid, which is the, I think it's the world's most visited museum um, with like 555,000 square meters of uh, exhibition space. There's that beautiful repetitive digit again. And um, the, uh, the Louvre pyramid itself, I showed in Secrets in Plain Sight with a geometric analysis that it, it deconstructs into 666 rhombi. Now, it's been reported that it has that many panes of glass, but that's incorrect. It does not. It's, it, you have to analyze it geometrically and count up all the rhombi. And what's fascinating about that to me is that that is the solar number, 666. 
um, it is the the sum of all the rows and columns in the in the magic square of the sun. And so it's recognized as this powerful solar symbol, you know. And the Louvre pyramid, if you look at it um, from above, it actually is exactly this astrological diagram that was made um, back in the 17th and 18th centuries. They, they had square astrological charts. And it reminds me of Johannes Kepler, who actually um, did astrological charts for people. Uh, and so there's the, some of his charts remaining um, that look exactly like the floor plan of the Louvre pyramid in the surrounding courtyard. Um, and I think that that was not lost on I.M. Pei, who designed the pyramid, um, which was very controversial at the time. It was, uh, I think it was 1989 for the um, bicentennial of the French Revolution. Um, when it was unveiled, you know, uh, also the pyramid is in a golden ratio relationship with the, the whole um, plaza there. Um, and I have some graphics that I, I might dig up and, and show in the in the podcast video. Um, but adjacent to the Louvre pyramid, with all of its incredible sacred geometry, is a, a sculpture, uh, equestrian sculpture of the Sun King, Louis XIV on horseback. And it's done in a style that's reminiscent of Alexander the Great. So it, it's kind of like Louis the Fourteenth is shown connecting with another great conqueror, you know, another another very important figure in history, Alexander the Great, and and you know th this this equestrian statue is kind of off to the side, and when you first see it there, you're just like, oh yeah, they just wanted to fill this space, I guess, with the statue. Um, it's kind of ran it seems kind of random where it is maybe, but that that's very important because that the location of that statue marks the endpoint. Of the, of the historical axis of Paris. And so to me, it represents um, the king, the, the, the leader, but, always, but in the form of a, of a human. So it's really representing man or um, the human condition. Um, and then we're taking that notion all the way down the axis. And we're gonna be kind of upgrading that human all the way along the way. All the way down to the Grand Arch, and so a great journey of um. Did you say Scott that Louis the Fourteenth was linked to the Sun, or was he called the Sun King? You just mentioned yeah, yeah, he early. Was, he was called the Sun King. He he was he had the longest reign of any European monarch, um, even more than Queen Elizabeth uh, today, who's approaching his seventy-two year reign, but she's not quite there yet, um, mm -hmm. I believe, and um, he was arguably the most powerful royal in history. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, he's the one who made Versailles. <laughs> he grew up there in the Louvre uh, Palace, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was living there, and but then he decided to move his whole court to Versailles to kind of, uh, in a genius move, to kind of keep track of all of the, the uh, you know, uh, people that might stab him in the back. Um, he was able to monitor them and kind of make their lives um, all about him. I remember uh, people would like, vie with each other to to like watch him get up out of bed in the morning. You know, it, it was ridiculous. <laughs> He was, he was amazing. In, in, in did, kind of the, did Louis XIV have a bit of a an ego? Yeah, I think. yeah, I think he would be the definition of, of ego. Yeah, basically. yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, um, um, enough about the Sun King, but yeah, he, he does uh, occupy the start of the axis. So we're, it's all about solar symbolism here throughout Paris, and, and it always comes back to that. So I think it's very... Without reducing it, it's there. like, could, could you say the starting point is like this dude on a horse at the Louvre? I yeah, mean, yeah. to my basic way of looking at it, you know? Yeah. So he, And you could be yeah. forgiven because the Louvre looks so fancy. You walk out and you go, that's just a random statue of a dude on a horse. And yeah. you wouldn't really pay a lot of attention to it. 
yeah, necessarily. It, when you're standing there in front of the Louvre pyramid, you're like, why is the horse like randomly over there? You know? <laughs> yeah. But but yeah. It, it's it, there's a point. There's a reason for it. And if you stand at the horse and look down the way, you're right on the axis and everything will line up all the way down to the Grand Arch. Um, and so um, this is kind of amazing because this was hundreds of years in the making, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. of, of bringing all this stuff together. And Louis XIV was the one who started it off um, by, uh, you know, Re rearranging the urban fabric of Paris to, to start making this happen. Um, but if we if we go to the next um, item on the list, I think we go right over the pyramid in Versailles, which is the inverted pyramid, you know, and, and in alchemy, you have the, the upward facing and the downward facing triangles that represent, you know, fire and water or any polarity like that. And so I think it, it's easily, I think it, a lot of people might overlook the pyramid in Versailles because when you're standing there, it's not on the horizon, it's underneath. Um, but you can access that from, you know, in the complex below. And it's quite dramatic to see this inverted glass pyramid come down to a point. And I remember in the Da Vinci Code movie, they had a scene there, you know, with, with the, I think it was um, right underneath that, in, in that fiction, there was like the crypt of, um, you know, what was it? Um, Mary Magdalene underneath there or something. Um, mm, I, I don't remember. Actually, I didn't know that, Scott, that that inverted pyramid. So the way I look at these things, Scott, there's kind of like, you know, this this kind of royal road, if you like. And it's like you could think of it like a like a, a string of beads, you know, and there's this like just this golden string that rolls all the way from this dude on the horse at the Louvre all the way up to the, to the Grand Arch. And there's these very significant beads on that rope that you've mm -hmm. identified that have this give this beautiful kind of connected story. But um, that's interesting because I do remember being in the Louvre and it's the you're inside and you have this pyramid obviously dropping down into the, you kind of have to go into the basement to see that pyramid, don't you? Yeah, there's like all um, these fancy shops down there, like jewelers yeah, and, and, yeah, and places yeah, yeah. like you probably that. would never afford, you know, but you're like, oh, wow, yeah. that's cool to look at, you know? Um, okay. And you wouldn't yeah. see it from above ground, presumably, but that's one of the beads on the rope, basically. Right. It is, is it? open to uh. the sky, but there's all these hedges around it in a, tra I think, and it's a traffic circle. But it's kind okay. of a side note here on this on this journey, but we're okay. passing gotcha. right by it, you know, so I thought gotcha. I would mention it. But the, sure, the sure. next really important bead on the rope would be the mm -hmm. um, Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, which is a, yes. um, a monumental triumphal arch that it has three uh, arch archways. Um, and it's at the scale it's kind of like more at the human scale as compared to the uh, Arc de Triomphe uh, way down the way. So mm -hmm. the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel is uh, kind of a smaller arch that has um, equestrian statues on the top four of them with Apollo in the chariot. So Apollo is, you know, riding his chariot, um, you know, pulling the sun across the sky. So it's very solar in that regard. And the, the idea of the carousel is, is kind of evocative of, of the motion of the planets. And in fact, there are elliptical um, uh, markers in the landscape around the arch, which to me represent the motion of planets ara around mm. the sun. So the sun would be right above the arch. Mm -hmm. And so when you walk underneath that arch, it's like you're, you're inhabiting that position of, of being the sun. So we've gone from the embodiment of the sun king in the statue to now you walking underneath the arch and now you you're in the position of the sun in relationship to the planets around you. And so it's almost like a little solar system. You're like the center of the solar system when you're there. Mm. Okay. Can and I then I share one thing. Yeah, go ahead. So um just I remember you speaking about this and I really liked the way you said there's kind of a ramping up happening, you know, so you go from one individual on horseback and I know on the Arc de Triomphe, the carousel, um, I quite like that there's four or five, you know, people on horseback. So it's kind of feels like it's, 
you know, it's building, if you like, you go from one to four, there's now like a little herd or a little tribe of, you know, horses, I think, is there, I think there, are, four, there are four horses that Apollo yeah. has uh, reigned to um, there. Okay. I don't know, there might be some more on the sides. I can't remember, but, yeah. um, but basically this arch is, um, is much larger than a human, you know, you're walking mm -hmm. underneath it and, and, mm -hmm. and yet, so you've ramped up from the size of a person on horseback to this, this big archway. And so mm -hmm. you're definitely moving up in scale. Got um, it. And then I, I like that. And if you keep walking along the historical axis, you'll go to the, through the Tuileries gardens, which um, I've, I've shown in, in secrets in plain sight and in my blog and books um, has this kind of sacred geometry that is um, Originally, it came from like Stonehenge, and then it was echoed in Jerusalem. And then I think Paris is a kind of new Jerusalem, in a sense, with the same sacred geometry it repeated. And of course, that geometry was repeated in uh, New York City's Central Park on the US dollar bill, that the proportions of the dollar bill are like that. Um, it goes on and on, and, and it, it's, in, it's in Chicago's Grant Park. Um, it's in a lot of places in the world, this kind of five to 12 rectangle. And, mm -hmm. and there's two fountains in the gardens. Uh, one is round and one is octagonal. And they sort of represent the, the two holiest places in Jerusalem. You know, the, the, um, the Holy of Holies in the, in the Temple of Solomon is the round basin. And then you have the, um, the uh, place where Jesus was crucified um, and ro rose from the dead. Uh, in the octagonal fountain. So mm -hmm. it's all like planned there in the garden and, and you just aren't aware, aware of it when you're walking through, but it has tremendous significance. And the center of that round fountain there, which represents the Holy of Holies is uh, 666.66 miles to um, the center of the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, mm -hmm. you know, which is the, the, the end point of the um, Camino, the whole uh, epic pilgrimage oh. is, is everyone is trying to get there. And, mm -hmm. and, and that is the center of, of the cathedral, the round point. It, it, okay. It's fascinating to me that it's this precise solar number distance from the Holy of Holies there in, in Paris, you know. That's incredible. Yeah. And so that, so in the garden, there's that 512 rectangle and you've sort of caught these correspondence between what's the Solomon's is, is that the temple of the dome or something I, I'm, I'm probably not remembering that um, right but I think no um uh, so the the temple of Solomon was destroyed in in you know ancient times and and mm -hmm. all that's left of of that is the uh the western wall which is like the most sacred place in Judaism today uh -huh. and on top okay. of the temple mount you have the dome of the rock which is sacred oh, to, rock. to oh, all three yeah. Abrahamic religions, you know, it has mm -hmm. the foundation stone that um, I, Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac on and Muhammad uh -huh. took off for his night flight there. And um, yeah. so very important, but um, the actual, I, I believe that the actual location of the Holy of Holies is just, um, I don't know, maybe a hundred feet, some, some small number of feet north of that. It's under this um, little tiny uh, dome called the Dome of the Spirits there. And uh, that is actually the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, I believe, in Solomon's temple. And wow. because, because it fits with the sacred geometry of the entire city. Wow. And so I think that um, it's not really under the Dome of the Rock, but it's just a few, a few hundred feet um, north of that, still on the Temple Mount. Um, and wow. this was a, a theory uh, made by Asher Kaufman, I think, back in the 70s. He wrote a, um, an, a dissertation on this, and he's the one who figured out um, where that was, where, where that location was. That's not, I might be, I know, I'm, we're going to stay on the axis, but I can't help myself. Can I ask one more question, and then I promise I'll be good, okay? No, um, please ask away well, as much do, as you like. 
do you remember um, in uh, in Secrets in Plain Sight, you were speaking about something like that. And I remember you found a special spot where it was like you went down seven arches deep and then there was like the sacred inscription of the name of God. Yeah, that, that it's, was it's actually nine, nine arches. Oh, nine. OK, yeah, yeah. yeah. What? OK, yeah. And, um, and I really it, it was like um, it was the uh, the whole Templar story, right? It happened yeah, yeah, around yeah. the year 1100. And, and, and actually like 1111, something like that. And, uh, and you know how the, the nine poor knights of Christ, there were nine yeah. of them, they, uh, they excavated something underneath the Temple Mount. And when they came back from Jerusalem, they became fabulously wealthy and they became the first international bankers and they gained all this incredible power. They had a military, yeah. they they started, they actually started to worry the French king that they were going to become more powerful than him. And he and the Pope kind of conspired to have them all taken out on that fateful Friday, the 13th, um, 13, what was it? 1307, something like that. Ah, okay. Yeah. But uh, that temple that where they dug down, that's not linked to this place in the Jerusalem gardens, is it? I'm getting my places not, mixed up there. That that would be a fabulous kind of fiction that in yeah, uh, that's what I was thinking. That there is like <laughs> the nine levels deep, like underneath the Tuileries Gardens or something. You yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. I, I don't know of that. You know. Yeah, maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll do that for another podcast. You know. But anyway, I want to keep <laughs> us on track. We're on this yeah. magic string, and we're talking about the beads on the rope. You know. So yeah. so far we've gone from Louis the Fourteenth. That's that's at, at the human scale. One man on a horse. We've gone to the um, Arc de Triomphe, the carousel, which is kind of ramping up the scale where you go, go to this beautiful archway in, in, in the Garden the Tuileries or at the beginning of the Garden of Tuileries. Yeah. And um, you've got so these now we've, we've walked all the way through the gardens now. Uh -huh. We've come to the end of the gardens and now it's a busy kind mm -hmm. of street. It's, a, it's kind of a large elliptical traffic circle that goes around the Egyptian obelisk in the middle. Okay, and um, so this obelisk is right on the axis and it has a golden tip, you know, that is sort of marking the axis. And so the obelisk represents the sun mm -hmm. and uh, the elliptical traffic circle that goes around it represents the, the path of the planets. Mm -hmm. And the area of this entire um, Place de la Concorde is 86,400 square meters, which I think is fascinating that that is the exact area. Um, and yeah. what, why is that significant, Jeff? Okay, oh, well, Scott, let me tell you, 864 is a number I love to talk about because the diameter of the sun is 864,000 miles. So whenever you or I see 864, we tend to sort of denote that number to be a solar number simply because of its connection to the scale of the, the sun, you know. Um, and interestingly, it's also linked to time, like the 86,400 is the amount of seconds we have in every individual day, you know, um, you know, which is the amount of time the spot on the earth has to rotate exactly until it's back where it started, you know, in regard um, to the sun. So it's kind of interesting to me that this 864 happens. But I wanted to ask you another thing. So if I'm right now, we're on the third bead on our rope here, right? We've gone from Louis XIV, the, the carousel arch. And now we've we've walked forward into the middle of this open um, kind of, op it's a very big area, really. Um, it's, a, you know, a wide open space. And in the middle of this space, um, there's this very specific obelisk, you know. And, um, and, and you know, it's, it's Place de la Concorde. It's where the guillotine was set up. It's where the was obelisk it? is now. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Was yeah. it? So that's that's why. Uh, and you say the obelisk is it denotes the sun because I know we're on a solar theme here, which is pretty cool. But yeah. I just I'd love to ask you more about why do you say the obelisk denotes the sun? What is it about the obelisk that you you feel is linked to the sun? Well, it um, is it because of the eight six forty ancient Egyptian culture and the 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 notion of an obelisk is actually a sun ray. Oh, is it? Oh, I didn't know that. That it represents. Ah. Okay, okay. Yeah. And by the way, just this particular obelisk, and this is where I kind of go, oh, this is kind of cool, goofy chat between Scott and Jeff nerding out on geometry coincidences, you know? 
But I loved the bit you you found out that that particular obelisk actually used to stand in Luxor, like this very, very piece of rock, which has all these magic Egyptian inscriptions and everything, was transported from Egypt, specially to be housed here. And then, and it was, I think that was partnered with another obelisk in, in Luxor, wasn't it? They, they were part the, of a the, pair. The one, the other, they all, always come in pairs in front of Egyptian temples and the, and the other one is still there in Luxor. Yeah. Yeah. But this one was moved 33 degrees across the planet to where it is now in Paris. And it was done in the Napoleonic era. And Peter Tompkins wrote a wonderful um, a book called The Magic of Obelisks that okay. goes into the most detail about that that I've read. Um, and mm. the, those um, French uh, soldiers had a hell of a time uh, moving that thing. It was incredibly difficult. They almost couldn't do it, um, but they did. And <laughs> they had to wait like a whole year because they got it, <laughs> the tide or the, uh, the Nile, um, not the tide, but the Nile uh, receded. Uh, okay, the like level a day, of the water. A day before yeah. they got the thing on the barge. And then it was too late to move it. So they had to wait a whole other season of inundation. This, of course, was before the dam was built um, for the boat to float the obelisk again. And meanwhile, they were dying of all these um, uh, diseases they were getting. It was quite a drama anyway. um, But doesn't it show you, like, I mean, if nothing else, they were pretty determined to get this obelisk and is that part of the one is silver and one is gold? And is this the golden one? You no, know, no, like one represents. No, no it's not that about, vibe. No. no, I don't. I've no. never okay. heard that. But, cool. um, it has a golden peak, though, this one. I've seen that. Well, they, they put in, a cap on it, I think, probably okay. just to protect it from the elements from eroding. OK, um, but they didn't put a green cap on it, for example, like or a purple cap. They no, they, they, did, they didn't do that. No, they, yeah. they golden one. Um, we let we let that one go to coincidence, you know, yeah. Um, but so, okay, so we're on bead number three. This and of course, gold, gold represents the sun, right? And That's silver was, rep- yeah. represents the moon. So so it's appropriate yeah. that gold would be the, the cap of this uh, pyramidian of this obelisk that yeah. represents the sun. Also, this obelisk forms a cross axis with the historical axis going 90 degree angle. And if you go over the bridge and you go to the National Assembly there, which is the uh-huh. original place where people who sat on the left and sat on the right. It's where we talk about you're a leftist or someone on the right. You oh, know? is it? it wow. It's, it's in that building where, where, they, where they decided to see, sit on one side of the aisle or the other. Ah, and on the other end of that axis, you have the, uh, the Church of uh, Mary Magdalene you know, up the way. And I okay. remember going to some cafes there where I paid like $20 for a coffee. It was just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm interested in this whole Egypt connection with Paris, you know, but we'll come back to that. Let's stay on the beads on a rope for now. Well, so where I are think, we going next, Scott? Um, we're, we're going, we're getting in our car or we're getting yeah. a lift because it's quite a long way down the Champs-Élysées, which is like the most expensive retail street in the world, I believe. Mm-hmm. And you go down to the um, Arc de Triomphe, right? And it's a much larger monument. So it's more about the scale of the automobile, you know? Um, and, the, and you go around and around in this massive traffic circle around it. And there are 12 streets radiating out. And that, of course, that represents the zodiac, the twelve signs of the zodiac going around our uh, our planet. Our, our entire solar system is surrounded by the fixed stars in this ring that is uh, represented by the ecliptic, the path that the Earth takes around the sun. All the planets follow are on this plane of the ecliptic, and so these these constellations are in that plane, but they're distant from the from our system, you know. And, and so we have like Aries and, and going all the way around, you know, um, mm. the, the signs. And, and so I see this kind of as a larger scale idea of the solar system. It's not just looking at the sun and the planets, but now mm-hmm. we're looking at the whole relationship to the fixed stars. Uh, yeah. And so, again, we've ramped up to a, another level, another um, scale. And yeah. Of course, under that, I believe it's under that arch that you have the eternal flame you know, um, 
which is a concept that comes from ancient Greece um, that is still like the Olympic flame is this eternal flame, right? But we have the eternal flame there representing the, the, the unknown soldier, I believe. Is, is that where it is or is it in La Défense? I can't remember. I think it's in the Arc de Triomphe. I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm not sure, but I'm digging the idea of an a, of an a, eternal flame, you know. And, which, and what, which, what else do we know of that burns eternally? The sun, right? Yeah, 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 so, yeah. I so would definitely give is, you that one. This is, That's a good know, solar Very reference. solar, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, then we, we continue around. We keep going down the axis. Um, this is a yeah. macrocosm of, of the smaller one that was built. Yes. By, I think it was built by Napoleon. Um, and... and and the, the Arctic Triumph was built much later, right? Hey, you know what? We just need to stick to the geometry, dude. You know, yeah. we can let, you know, we're not going to get any marks for knowing who was in, okay. who was the president when the thing got built, you know. But yeah. but what I do like is when you, it's very, very visibly apparent when you look at the carousel arch. It's like one big arch in the center and two sidebar arches. Yeah. When you look at the Arc de Triumph, it's like one big arch in the center and two sidebar this arches. This is a Roman... And, archetype that they're repeating yeah. it's the concept of a triumphal arch like there's yes. uh, the one in rome you know right by the umbilicus urbis rome which is the name yeah. point of rome there's a ar there's a triumphal arch that was built kind of in celebration of a, the, a military campaign mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. that was that kind of template was laid down it has three doors Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Which is beautiful, by the way. I really, I really dig them. But the bit I wanted to just confirm with you is when you go from carousel to triumph, those two arches, mm -hmm. there's a very particular um, rising in the scale. I know I do. I, I totally understand where we're at. You're saying the carousel is kind of represents our sun and solar system and the planets. We go up a scale where we arguably we could say that the Arc de Triomphe now represents the zodiac and it's become um, more galactic or, or no, sorry. It's like it's the it's the constellations in this galaxy. Yeah. I kind of get that. Um, but just physically, right? Physically, like in terms of the actual bricks and mortar of these two It's like arches. double the size, you know. It's yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It was almost exactly double, though, wasn't it? Or, I think so. Or, yeah. I, I don't recall. Just, I don't. I think I made a graphic that compared them, and it, I, yeah. I'm remembering that, and it's like at least twice as big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then going up to the end of the axis, all the way to La Défense, you get to the Grand Arch, which is double mm -hmm. the size of the Arc de Triomphe, you know? Yes. So it's, yeah. it's the, the, the third level. And it's interesting that, it, you know, we're talking about three openings in the, in the um, Triumphal Arch. So yeah. we have three arches as well. Yeah. So it there's this, this Trinity idea that's carried through. Yeah. And uh, so in the in the Grand Arch, it's it it's different in the sense that it's not um, it's not like a really big Roman arch archetype at all. It's a totally different totally structure. Different. Totally so what different. it is, it's like um, it's like a, a void. It's like a cube within a cube, but the inner cube is a void. And mm -hmm. so what when you when you analyze the structure, you realize it's actually representing a hypercube or higher dimensional cube or tesseract mm -hmm. but um, it's like the shadow of that higher dimensional form the shadow in three dimensions would be what the the form of the structure is mm -hmm. okay and so <clears throat> to get up to the top you go up elevators like on on the on the sides um and then that's right there's I a massive roof a massive roof that goes across the top mm -hmm. and um and you've been you've been up there right Right. And yeah, you know, yeah. I thankfully to that lovely lady Chantal when I was 16. One of the places I went, I still have a memory of looking from the roof. A beautiful, I mean, just absolutely fantastic views long before I ever entertained any ideas of sacred geometry or anything about an axis, you know. I've been but on top very, of very the uh, the Arc de Triomphe. And, oh yeah. But and I remember taking pictures up there on a rainy day. But I haven't okay. been on the top of the Grand Arch. That would be so much more epic because you're you're quite a bit higher, twice yeah. as high, you know. And um, I know in the basement of that there there's um, a zodiac that's depicted in in the flooring, you know, in the pavement. There's literally a whole zodiac that has a ring ring that shows the different signs, and it you have to go into different rooms to see the whole thing because it goes all the way around um, wow. the structure, and wow. and so. 
uh, I thought that's fascinating. Why would this, this moder very modern building have this zodiac in the floor? You know, yeah. Plus it was being tied in with the kind of zodiac that is the Arc de Triomphe. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's being tied in with that. And it also has all these 400s in the 400 square meter multi-purpose rooms. And I can't remember right now, but there's many 400s in the design. And that ties what's in it, what's with our solar system. about 400? Yeah. It's like, um, like, I'm not remembering, but there's something like... Um, well, isn't this something like the, the scale of the sun is 400 times the volume of the earth or something like that? Or not, I don't think it's volume. I think it's, I think it's the distance. I think it's the, the sun is 400 times farther away than the moon is from oh, the yes. earth. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's also 400 times larger than the moon. 400 times larger than the That's moon. That's why yeah. um, we, when we have a total solar eclipse, the sun and moon disks appear to be the exact same size. Mm -hmm. um, it's because they converge on this same factor of 400 mm -hmm. and, uh, in terms of distance and size. So and, and, and so I think that number being referenced over and over again in the, in the architecture is referencing the, the sun and the moon. Mm, and that, mm. that seems perfect here with what we're talking about with, you know, constellations and solar symbols. We're, now we're bringing the moon in and we're, mm. we're relating all of that to the earth. Um, so it's very um, cosmic in a way. And, and I love that. It's, it's not just the mundane kind of like we're making an office building here, but um, they're making a, a monument. They're making a, yeah. it, it, it is used, um, you know, has multi reasons to exist, but it is, um, it's resonant with the entire complex of Paris. And I think the most important thing about that building is the notion of higher dimensionality. Okay, mm -hmm. so, the, so there we're looking at this kind of tesseract structure here. What does that well, mean? Like we're, 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 well, what is that, where is that leading us to, Jeff? What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, okay, so now you're getting me into like, you know, um, sort of familiar territory for Jeff, you know, where I'm like, very, very passionate about um, the Tesseract and the hyperdimensional cube. And just to explain to people what we mean by that, you know, um, basically, you know, when you're talking about dimensions in geometry, the way I look at it at a very simple level, if you draw a square on a page, on a piece of paper, just a simple square, that's in two dimensions. You know, you've got like your, your width and you've got your breadth. And then um, when you, 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 when you then bring that into the third dimension, which is where you and I live all day long on planet Earth, you've got like, you know, width, height and depth. OK, they're the three dimensions, basically. So your square in three dimensions is simply a dice. Everybody understands the shape of a dice, you know, yeah. put a dice in your hand. And now you have a cube, which is just a three dimensional shape. Yeah, we all know that all day long. And so we reside in the third dimension. And this is where this is like our home base. And so, you know, sacred geometry, you know, suggests that there are dimensions beyond the third dimension. And I know that mathematically this is proven and, and you know, it's quite straightforward and things like string theory and all, it's very much proven. Um, but I just like the sort of the, I like the sort of the metaphor for moving between dimensions as a kind of a metaphor for how we also can move to higher places in our own kind of development, in our own journey of growth, you know, that there are higher aspects of ourselves. So at the moment, if we're the kind of the sort of the mundane cube version of who we can be, there's also kind of like the higher version of who we can be, you know? And so in geometry, then, if you were to think about the cube in a higher dimension, so let's say the next dimension would be the fourth dimension, then the cube has a correlate in the fourth dimension, okay? And that is called a tesseract, all right? That's what that shape is called. And it can kind of seem a bit weird. It's like, well, what, what is a tesseract? What, um, well, well, it's, it's, what it goes beyond our intuition because we, we evolve in this three-dimensional realm. And so we understand height, width, and depth. But if we have a, a tesseract, it has height, width, and depth, and breadth. Okay. Yeah, or, that, or time, some people um, say, or movement, or yeah. something else. And that's what Bernard de Clairvaux said about what is God? 
he is height, width, depth, and breadth. Oh, so yeah. He, he said four dimensions, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and he, was yeah. The, he was the orator, very talented person who argued for the formation of the Templars and the beginning of the whole Gothic building program started wow. with him. You know, and I, I speculate that the Templars brought back knowledge from Jerusalem. Maybe they had some documents they, that they found that showed all the sacred geometry, which it later inspired the Gothic buildings that came yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so the fact the Grand Arch is a tesseract, right, is that's probably the thing that's most exciting, I think, for both of us, Scott, you know, certainly for me is kind of I never saw the Grand Arch as a tesseract, you know, until you um, identified it as such, you know, and once I saw it, as you laid it out, it's undeniably a tesseract, like it's nothing else. It's clear as day. Yeah. And um, I was really blown away by that, you know, but just to like it, like just to sort of take in the plot here a little bit, Scott. When you identified it as a tesseract, did you do any measurements or did you do any kind of like, you know, mathematical analysis to kind of see how it lines up? Or because I just kind of look at it and go, oh, my God, that's exactly what a tesseract looks like on Wikipedia. That's well, that, enough for me. Yeah, that that's that when you when you are familiar with the geometry and the mathematics and you know what a tesseract looks like already, then and you look at the grand arch, you go, oh, my God, it, there, it, it's definitely a tesseract. Yeah. And you don't need to measure it because it just fits that archetype. Um, Perfectly. I, I did analyze the measurements and it, it's not a perfect cube. You know, it's 110 meters by 108 meters or something like that. I, I can't remember, but um, uh, it doesn't matter. And, and actually, those measurements are a way that they've encoded pi. And I've, I've shown that. I remember doing that. Wow. Um, so, so they're like, they were chosen to encode this transcendental number also. Um, mm. And so that's just another layer. And all these things I think are just new layers of appreciation that come out when you just, yeah. when I discover or present these things and they're just meant for you to go like, wow. And to blow your mind, even on another level, you know, yeah. it gets back yeah. to the idea of higher dimensions and the higher self that, that mm -hmm. we are multidimensional beings. We're not just mm -hmm. these kind of flesh bags that, uh, or have a three-dimensional <laughs> appearance and that's Skin it. encapsulated egos no yeah. in fact if yeah. you think about our bodies there's no atom in you that is the same atom that was there five years ago you know everything's yes. been replaced yes. in your body by new material and so mm -hmm. you're really not a bunch of stuff you're a pattern you're, yeah not only that you're an evolving pattern mm. you're aging and your body is changing and 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 you know, you're going, you're really this complex pattern, this complex um, dynamic pattern, you know. Mm -hmm. And so when we see these patterns in cities, they kind of seem to have a life to them in a way that we have a life. We have this complex pattern. And sometimes these patterns are in cities and you, it just makes you step back and wonder what's going on here and mm -hmm. who's responsible for these things. And um, mm. is, is there a vast conspiracy that laid this all out? Or is that conspiracy one that exists at a higher level, you know, mm. uh, of, of higher selves that, that have been patterning the cities in the hopes that they would act as a kind of textbook for us to, to move on to a higher level, to reconnect mm. with, that, with that part of ourselves that, or that is we so it, desperately need to connect with, you know? Yeah, yeah. I love it, Scott. I love what you're saying. I, I wonder as well, you know, um, I wonder, is there kind of like architects involved in like encoding these very specific things? Like, I wonder when the architect was making the Grand Arch, did he go, oh, I know I'm going to throw down here. Yeah, I'm going to go for the whole four dimensional vibe. And the best thing to represent that is a building that looks like a tesseract. Boom, boom, you know, like yeah. mic drop moment, you know, well, if or, they did, why weren't they like championing that? I'm yeah, sure their yeah, yeah. Have gotten involved and said, "Hey, I'm making this cool tesseract thing here." Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, they didn't, and, and and it just goes unnoticed. You know, like what's up with that? Um, and yeah, and then I wonder. It's at a higher level beyond the level of comprehension of the individual human designer. You know, do you know who the architect of the Grand Arch was? 
Johann Otto von Spreckelsen. Ooh, cool name. And that cool person name. was chosen by Mitterrand to, uh, wow. to build it. And it was a sham competition. They had a design competition, architects all over the world. And in the end, Mitterrand just chose someone that he liked. Wow. So the competition I wonder could we get him? Not, it was irrelevant. He'd be a cool guest for a podcast. I wonder, is he still around? No, he, he died uh, during oh. the construction. Oh, that's sad. Um, yeah. The um, Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, it would be cool to talk to him, though, wouldn't it? And if he, he could just say, OK, you two boys are extremely crazy. You uh, need to go and get some mental I'm sure, I'm health, sure he would. help with your mental health. That, you I've know? heard that before by um, like... Uh, I've heard that before from from different architects that they they're not aware of this kind of symbolism that's in their very yeah. buildings. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And yet, I wonder if if they, how did that happen? You know, um, it's fascinating. Well, there's yeah. two things. What one, one is, one is, could they be a channel for some kind of like you know higher intelligence that kind of like uses them as like a vehicle or a vessel to manifest this beauty and this gorgeousness. The other thing that could be going on, and I think you and I need to really acknowledge the possibility that, you know, the principle of psychological projection could be operating through Scott and Jeff. And because we're so, we carry a particular lens that we look at the world through, then what we do is we project out the way we see things out onto the world, you know? And, Neither are right or wrong, by the way. It doesn't mean projection bad, uh, channeling good, or or the other way around. You know, um, maybe it's a little bit of both. I don't know. You know, but but um, and I don't think it really matters. Actually, I think I th what I think is very cool is the more you kind of lay out these beads on the rope, and the more you get the correspondences to the sun, the more it's kind of like it's kind of beautiful at any level, even if it's just you and me psychologically projecting here, it adds a whole a whole layer of beauty to your next trip to Paris at the very, very basic level. Yeah. I personally think it's a lot more than that. I actually do. I mean, I'm willing to own it might be projection, but but I- I, I, I think just... a lot of people project a negativity on, on the subject, um, mm. but that's their own choice. You know, like mm -hmm. for example, the notion of the all-seeing eye, you know, the, the mm. eye inside the equilateral triangle um, mm. as a kind of, and the eye on the top of the dollar bill as a kind mm. of, um, you know, control from the powers that be and so on is mm. one projection of that, right? But yeah. another one is what is the, the all-seeing eye, um, the best all-seeing eye that you can think of might be the sun, right yes it, 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 yeah yeah all seeing in all directions all the time it's outputting all giving power, ever generous yeah billions of giver years, of life you know yeah and, giver of and, life and, and, and yeah. so yeah it's a giver of life it, and it's yeah it's illumination it, it's but yeah it, does it mean it's in the, the illuminati master no it, it's the it's a beautiful yeah. natural phenomenon yes yeah yeah the um, sun and so you you can you can get in all this negative rabbit hole about the Illuminati that you imagine mm. exists um, mm -hmm. if you like, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it's more fulfilling at the end of the day to take the high road and to, yeah. to take, take the notion that illumination is about knowledge. It's about learning. It's about um, growing. It's about yeah. life. And also um, I suppose, for me, illumination is about, you know, opening to, you know, the fact that we're all kind of like on a journey of growth somehow, like we're all growing into the best version of who we can become, you know, whether we like it or not, that's, that's the direction of all of our lives, you know, and so, you know, if we can kind of illuminate ourselves with a kind of a an inner wisdom of some sort, you know, the higher self or whatever word you want to use for it, you know, that is a kind of an illumination from within that I quite, I quite like those type of metaphors, you know? So if we can kind of illuminate ourselves with some form of higher intelligence, you know, whether that's our higher self or something even higher than that, whatever works for you. I like that idea of like, you know, the best way to transform ourselves is by, you know, awakening, 
you know, to hire troops or whatever. And the only way you do that is kind of like it's an inside job, you know, not not kind of going outside yourself looking for some answers, but actually just, you know, in meditation or whatever. And then and then you can kind of upgrade yourself and then you see beauty all around you, you know, like I just think all this stuff is gorgeous. Like I just like feel, you know, I mean, I, I don't even think there's anything sinister in it. It's just a whole load of good, beautiful gorgeousness all the way through. I mean, the 666 in the uh, in the Louvre, I mean, okay, that's a bit creepy. Like, you know, you, I know it's number of the beast and blah, blah, blah. So in the Bible, that, that's, it, all it says yeah. is it's the number of a man is what yeah, it says. Exactly. It doesn't and say it says, it's, it's a terrible Satan or something. Yeah, six it, score. That, that's a says, projection or, that yeah, 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 yeah. on it, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, I don't I don't care for that too much. I mean, do, the bit that interests me is more like, is there a group of architects and President Mitterrand and powerful people who go, okay, we've got this trip laid out. There's this really cool rope running through our city. We have these beads on the rope and it kind of goes from man to this kind of cool arch and then it's the grand arch. And it's just the coolest coincidence that they all line up, you know? Now we are thinking of building a new part of Paris it's going to be all fancy and all singing and all modern and all fancy. And we want something really cool to land there. And I really dig four dimensional intelligence, you know, um, and I'd love something to sort of honors that, you know, I don't think that happens. I would be surprised if that, I, if that I, meeting took place. I, I would say, I don't know. I kind of disagree. I think that um, a lot of these leaders are Freemasons and I think that helps to motivate them to, want to encode certain patterns in cities and okay i don't see any harm in that um i, I find yeah. it curious that they don't talk about it though and that, that kind of irritates me that why is that a secret um, yeah it should be it's an open knowledge kind of thing and, and Mr. celebrant was involved with sergi pontoise which is another city that has all these incredible encodings in it and okay um, uh the was late Mitterrand Philip, a mason i don't know if he was Okay. Okay. Uh, that would be interesting to find out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But, but he was definitely either. involved in approval of a lot of these things, which, which have um, uh, incredible encodings in them. But again, it's wow. a, it's an open question whether that individual was aware of that or not. And I at, wonder if the, end of the day, it doesn't wrong. matter what, what yeah. somebody thought about it, about the patterns that are existing around you. I mean, they're there. If President Mitteron is listening and you'd like to come on our next podcast and <laughs> yeah. um, you'd be a very welcome guest, yeah. you know, yeah. um, but it would be cool to talk to him, wouldn't it? You know, be, to yeah. go, imagine, imagine we got him on a podcast and he goes, oh, you guys, you got me, you got <laughs> well done, you know, you cracked the code, you know, um, but who knows, who knows, maybe it's something channeled through them, maybe it's you and me projecting, either way, it's a pretty cool pattern. The other thing though, and this then, this is like kind of a good curtain closer, right, is just for like, you know, you know, giggles and extra fun, this whole alignment, this whole kind of special royal rope with all these beautiful beads on it, is lined up with the heliacal rising of Sirius, true or false, Scott? True, and, th and that is the phenomenon that the ancient Egyptians based their calendar on. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And um, another fascinating thing is in that calendar, I believe it's the Sothic year, it has 365 days. And so over eons of time, it drifts um, because it doesn't account for the kind of 0.24 days that, that we have for leap year. Uh, uh -huh. It takes 1,461 years for that cycle to repeat, I think was the number, I could be off, but okay. that, that number sticks out in my memory. And that is actually the number of days in four years. And so wow. in some way, the Olympics is a kind of um, connected to this idea instead of, you know, it has 1,461 days in an Olympic cycle, and there's 1,461 years in the Sothic cycle. Interesting. And so that's yeah. not fascinating. And I, yeah. and I wonder, like, you know, the Antikythera mechanism, which was this mm -hmm. amazing kind of um, mechanical computer that would calculate um, eclipses and, 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 and everything and all this astrological stuff. Um, it also had a little Olympic calendar on it, which the, the yeah. scholars have said, oh, they, it was just telling when the next Olympics was. I don't think so. I think that was the Sothic here. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They weren't. I'm just. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's. I just want to talk about the heliacal rising thing, right? Because I actually remember listening to Jonathan Quinton on a video, and he he expressed it really beautifully. Where he, if I'm understanding it right, the the heliacal rising of Sirius basically means there's one day in the year. I think it's in July, and it's a very very special day because it, it depends on your latitude and and um, some other atmospheric factors. But, okay. Yeah, but you're, but you're basically. Is this the right vibe about it? That essentially, it's it, the reason it's special is because, and it only happens one day in the year where the star Sirius rises before the sun. And what used to happen in the plains of Egypt is that on this one day, you would you would have the star Sirius rise, and it would rise to a certain point in the sky where it would just shine perfectly into this channel that was cut right the way through the pyramid that went into the queen's chamber. And then this beautiful pinky kind of light, because it was different to the light of the sun, shone through this channel and then it hit this tablet or something in the queen's chamber, not sure the detail there, but, but basically when that light um, beam from Sirius hit the queen's chamber, and it hit a certain like it's a bit like Newgrange here in Ireland, which I kind of love these alignments. Um, and then it 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 hit this thing in the Queen's Chamber, and then that then denoted the beginning of the Egyptian New Year, you know. Yeah. And then so that's a big deal. I mean, imagine the whole pyramid, right, being built to catch that thing. That's a mm -hmm. big deal. They, so the rising of Sirius is a big deal. I don't totally know why, but it just seems it's a big well, deal if you're going to go to that trouble. Egyptian myth and Isis and Osiris and the 70 days that she's under yes. the horizon. And then the, the heliacal rising is the return kind of of, of Isis. Okay. You know, Sirius is the brightest star in the sky because it's our closest star, uh, the brightest star in the sky, and it's uh, the star of Isis, right? And so yeah. it rises just before the sun. And as soon as the sun comes up, it's so bright that you can't see it anymore. Yes. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Wow. And, and so, so um, the Jean Elysees, the historical axis of Paris is oriented to capture that. And I believe uh -huh. it's actually in early, early August uh, at that latitude okay. when it happens. Yeah. Um, you'll see the, the, now if you could see the horizon perfectly, mm -hmm. probably have mm -hmm. to be up on top of the Grand Arch to see this. But you would yeah. see that star rising there right before the sun. How rises. cool. And then so think of the link to Egypt. Like you have the obelisk that, that came from Egypt in the Place de la Concorde. And you have this whole alignment then lined up with this, this serious gig. You know what I mean? And so that really, that's the bit that makes me think this isn't just kind of Jeff and Scott projecting. Do you know what I mean? Well, it's kind of it, like yeah, yeah. just too much. Just too much going on. I mean, I'm assuming, by the way, all this stuff checks out. Like, I haven't gone and done the looked at Sirius at some day and the uh, in Paris, you know. I've but done I'm trusting... research, and and there's um like some Freemasons talk about this, and okay, there's also like a Siri a helical rising calculator that you can find on the internet, uh -huh. or there was when uh -huh. I did this research, and you can put in the latitude and 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 the you know, the uh, I remember it involved something with atmosphere um, okay. as well. Yeah. To determine the precise day that it happens on, and and then you wow. can determine the ang the azimuth uh, that that okay. is on. It's right down the Champs Elysees. Another thing that's fascinating is it's the same that happens in Washington D.C. with Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> so these so, avenues of power, you know, yeah, uh, that, are, that are the most important avenues of power in these countries are lined up with this. I'm going to uh, look more into this, this heliacal rising of Sirius, you know, yeah. um, and there's some I heard a cool vibe that maybe our sun is in a binary dance with Sirius. You yeah. Know, yeah. Did you hear, um, you hear about that one? Oh, yeah. Walter Cruttenden yeah. has this binary companion theory. Um, yeah. It's borne out by astronomical research of um, mm. tracking the star Sirius and recognizing that that Sirius does not process like the other stars. It's uh -huh. because we're bound to it in a um, mm. we're, it's our binary star and we're we're orbiting a common very center. You know, it's like the, wow. our solar system and the Sirius system are orbiting each other. 
you know, I get around, you. around I a, get you. A, a point in a dance in space. So we have this, we have this kind of nice kind of connection to Sirius then our star and Sirius, like our sun and Sirius, they've got a vibe going on. That's right. And I wonder what's in that. It actually has multiple to... stars in it as a system, wow. but um, it, there's a lot of complexity to it, but mm -hmm. um, it's amazing that it's, taken like millennia and then Walter Crutton comes along and says wait look at this folks <laughs> and and you know he 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 wrote a great book on it and and there's and there's great evidence yeah. but I don't think it's widely accepted um okay okay yeah fortunate that um astronomers aren't don't find it relevant or something but I I kind of yeah. feel like in the in the future in the next couple hundred years when we when we have spaceships that go out there we'll go Walter might I, be a, a we'll Galileo be like, oh my god <laughs> we're in a binary <laughs> star system <laughs> you know it's it's kind of like we're yeah. so full of ourselves that we think we know it all and yeah we don't, we don't yeah, even yeah. know we don't even know the basics and something yeah. like I think it was like 80 percent of the stars that we see with the telescope are binary systems okay so, so it's not rare. It would make sense. It would make sense. I mean, I don't know is the truth, but it's interesting to me that like all these cities, well, the Great Pyramid, you've got Paris, you're telling me Washington, D.C. They've all got a gig going with this, this rising of Sirius, you know, it makes me think it makes me go. That's interesting. You know, I like this stuff. It kind of make I, it just it it's kind of mysterious for me. And I like that feeling. But Scott, you know what? I think um we've kind of gone off from Paris, you know, but, but that's, what's beautiful about speaking about these ideas. It gets you going, doesn't it? It's like, if, if we do anything, it's like stimulating the, the, the sort of the, the majesty of how geometry can really open your mind to just thinking of these ideas is kind of, it's kind of feels nice if nothing else, you know? Yeah. But I hope, um, I hope our dear listeners have enjoyed um, our journey through Paris and the beads and the rope. I certainly did. It's a it's a pleasure, Scott, to, you know, be it's a privilege, actually, to be able to gently journey alongside you and your genius. And thank you so much for all the brilliant work you do. And it's been a gift to unwrap that particular gem, you know, I think so, it, it, next time you all go to Paris, um, you'll have this in mind and you'll you'll never look at, at the city the same way again, hopefully. You'll, you'll have more to think about um, when you're there looking yeah. at these monuments. Yeah. Just make sure you bring lots of money because the cappuccinos are $20. <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> Not everywhere. I shouldn't say that. That's really unfair. I think you got unlucky in that place, you know. I went to but, the, um, the most fashionable place and you yeah. know, you got to pay for that. <laughs> but Scott, it's been great as always. Um, thank you, dear listeners. If you've listened this far through to the podcast, I'm guessing you enjoyed it. I hope you did. We'll be back really soon um, with another sacred geometric chat of one kind or another. And we'll see you then. Thank you very much. <laughs>